There are a range of different approaches to equity valuation that can be adopted by investors. In this learning objective, we describe those various approaches. So the idea of fundamental analysis uh, as an investment strategy is to get a measure of the intrinsic value of a firm and compare that to the share price. We look at the intrinsic value of the firm by assessing its current and future profitability. As discussed in previous learning objectives, often that profitability will be examined using a top-down approach where we consider both macroeconomic and industry influences uh, as getting an assessment as to what the future profits of the firm should be. So the purpose of fundamental analysis is to identify mispriced stocks relative to some measure of true value. The key, the key question or the key challenge is to ask how we actually come up with that true value measure. Now, there are many investors who would argue that this approach to investing doesn't have merit, uh, although we have to be a little bit cautious when uh, we warn against uh, valuation. So an example is Henry Blodgett, a Merrill Lynch equity research analyst in January 2000, uh, stated that valuation is often not a helpful tool in determining when to sell hypergrowth stocks. So obviously at the time he was making this statement about a company called uh, Internet Capital Group, uh, and this was right in the middle of the dot-com bubble. So in the, during the dot-com bubble, uh, according to many different models of valuation, these internet companies were overvalued, but we had this view from investors that uh, this was just a flaw with the valuation models that weren't able to accurately capture the growth prospects of firms, as opposed to it being an actual bubble whereby stocks were mispriced. Well, uh, interestingly for, for Henry, at the time he made this statement, uh, Internet Capital Group was tra trading at a market cap of $174 million. Uh, one year later, the market cap of the company was just $3 million. So this is a, a, an example where, well, maybe there was some merit in valuation. So there have always been some investors in financial markets who have argued that market prices are determined solely by perceptions or by uh, supply and demand factors that are based on uh, the, the, the beliefs and potentially the, the biases of investors. Now, while perceptions matter, they can't be the only matter. And what we should find that in a relatively efficient market, that uh, firm fundamentals are the, the key determinant of prices. And uh, if there are any mispricings, what we might be able to do is try to get a better model of those fundamentals to try to identify what the true value of the stock should be. So it's important when we think about valuation is that we start with identifying some misconceptions about uh, what this process is all about. So what are some of the misconceptions associated with, uh, with this security analysis process? The first misconception is that valuation is an objective search for true value. It's important to note that all valuations are biased to some extent. The only questions are by how much they're biased and in what direction. So the magnitude and direction of your bias is directly apportion, uh, proportional to uh, the profit that you can generate on that investment strategy. What we're trying to do in terms of valuation is not necessarily find the true price, but find less biased estimates of true price than maybe those that other investors hold, such that we could profit from doing so. Second one uh, myth is that a good valuation provides a precise estimate of value. So it's important that there's no precise valuations. And, uh, for this reason, often uh, we find that a lot of analysts won't actually give a point estimate of value, but they'll give a valuation range as to the range they think the share should be valued between. So the value, the, the payoff to the valuation process is often greatest when valuation is least precise because in this circumstance you'll have a lot of conflicting views as to what the firm is actually worth. And if you can be the most accurate, you can profit the greatest from it. Uh, but even in, in these circumstances, you're never going to get an exact measure of valuation. So just, just coming up with an indicative range is, is often more useful. And the third myth is arguably the most important one at all. This is the, the myth that the more quantitative the model, so the more factors you have in your valuation process, the, meta, the, the better the valuation. But what's important to note is that one's understanding of the valuation model is probably as important as the output itself. And our understanding gets less as complexity grows and we have more inputs. So for this reason, often simple valuation models do better than much more complex ones. So in terms of complexity, what are some of the sources of complexity that we see in valuation models? Well, as computers have become more sophisticated and more powerful, uh, we can see that technology can often be used uh, to churn through huge amounts of data to, to come up with uh, 
patterns in data sets that might be used for valuation process. However, as well as just using um, the, this vast amount of historical data, we might also understand that there are some softer issues that need to be adhered to when we come through this valuation process and uh, simply just adding complexity and adding quantitative factors is going to skip out on some of those uh, softer uh, aspects of valuation. The costs associated with hugely complex models that uh, technology enables us to use is that first of all it might result in information overload. So when you have too much information, uh, people, because we all have limited cognitive capacity, can become overloaded to a point where we actually make poor input decisions uh, and hence uh, our valuation becomes biased for that reason. Uh, we might also suffer from black box syndrome where we don't actually understand the inner workings of our valuation models and we place too much trust in the output rather than having a, a firm understanding of, of where that valuation is coming from. And also, the more complex our model, often the, the greater the number of assumptions that we need to make. So we might be making assumptions such as uh, assuming particular variables, proxy for particular factors in either the firm's condition or the economic condition. But as assumptions grow, which is a natural uh, effect of complexity, uh, so to, to the potential for errors or bias. So for this reason, with respect to valuation, we often apply the principle of parsimony. This principle states that we should try to apply the simplest model that we can get away with. So we should not go add unnecessary inputs simply because it adds the complexity of the model. Uh, while we want a reliable model, uh, so it, doesn't, it shouldn't be too simple, uh, we also don't want one that's going to be overly complex. So with this in mind, what are some of the approaches that can be used to valuation? Well, there's three key approaches that are adopted and uh, we're going to look at all three of them. The first is the discounted cash flow valuation. Discounted cash flow is based on the basic principle in finance that the price of an asset should be the present value of its future cash flows. So two different approaches to discounted cash flow valuation uh, basically just use two different inputs as to what the expected future cash flow is going to be. Uh, in one instance, we assume that uh, the best measure of expected future cash flows to the investor are the dividends that are uh, expected to be paid by the firm. And hence the dividend discount model uh, measures the current value of the firm as the present value of those future dividend pay payments. The free cash flow model is where we look at the net free cash flows generated by the firm uh, on an annual basis into the future and we value the firm as a function of the present value of those expected future net cash flows. So both have the same principle. The only thing that's different is the input in terms of how we're actually measuring the future cash flows expected to be generated by the investor. Sometimes, however, it can be quite difficult to get expected future dividend or, or net cash flow forecasts. So we might look for a more simple method of valuing a firm and relative valuation enables us to do this. The idea of relative valuation is it enables you to come up with an estimation of the value of an asset by looking at the price uh, uh, up against some comparable asset uh, with similar features. So relative valuation is quite commonly used in the real estate industry. We know that when a real estate agent will give an indicative value of what a property is worth, they'll consider like properties from the area and what they've sold for in the past. Same thing can apply in terms of uh, valuing stocks. We can look at stocks that have similar characteristics in terms of things like earnings, cash flows, book value or sales, and we can compare the market value of those two firms. And in fact, uh, a trading strategy known as AIRS trading is one where an investor will look at two firms that, that are very much matched in terms of those financial characteristics and buy or sell those shares as their, as their relative prices change through time, uh, considering them to, to be uh, substitutes for each other, so constantly buying the one that's cheaper and selling the one that's more expensive. Finally, we can use contingent claim valuation. Contingent claim valuation using, uses option pricing models. The idea here is that you can think of the value of shares as being a real option and therefore we can use option pricing models to come up with uh, a measure of, of what we think that real option should be worth. Just going to slightly more detail, uh, in terms of the dividend discount model we said before, uh, we know that um, we can use it only the, for those firms that pay a regular dividend. So this model uh, doesn't work if we've got, for example, a non-dividend paying stock. Um, so one requirement is that it's useful for firms with regular dividends and also 
we want those regular dividends to be an amount that is close to the free cash flow to equity of the firm. So we want a, quite a large payout ratio. Dividend discount model is also useful for firms where free cash flows are difficult to estimate. So a, a good example here are banks and financial service companies. These companies pay high dividends. Future forecasts of free cash flows are, are hard to come up with. So the dividend discount model tends to be the best approach. The free cash flow model is used for firms that pay uh, dividends that are significantly different from the free cash flows. So if you had a non-dividend paying stock, or perhaps a stock that paid a total cash dividend that was either less than 80% or greater than 110% uh, of the free cash flows of a firm, this might be a, a model because in that case, the free cash flows are a better measure of the expected future cash flows of the company. Uh, or also free cash flows, a wide uh, model is widely used for firms where dividends are not available. So private companies is a good example here, or initial public offerings. In these instances, we don't have a historical time series of dividend data that we can use for our valuation approach. Finally, what about relative valuation? Well, we spoke before, it's about comparing uh, the price of, of two assets that are considered to be comparable. The uh, basis for this is that the intrinsic value of an asset uh, is quite impossible to estimate, very difficult for us to forecast expected future cash flows and a discount rate. Hence, uh, a parsimonious way of estimating intrinsic value is just uh, by identifying two comparable stocks and coming up with uh, some way we can control the differences that, that might remain between those stocks and compare the price between them. So a range of different ways to, uh, to measure the value of a stock. Uh, we tend to prefer uh, relatively parsimonious approaches and uh, our discounted cash flow measures such as the dividend discount model and the free cash flow model uh, are those that tend to be most based in theory because they're grounded in the idea that the value of a firm should be the present value of future cash flows. And we do have some alternative measures of valuation, such as relative valuation, that are going to be useful in some instances where it's very difficult to come up with those future forecasts that are required as inputs into our, our discounted cash flow measures.